Good morning, everybody. Welcome to See the Futures. We have a very special guest today, and we're going to be talking about everything energies, energies that are on the move, especially in the futures markets. Before we get started, though, I do want to remind everybody, trading futures, options on futures involve substantial risk of loss, not suitable for all traders and investors. Oftentimes in futures trading, you have a high combination of leverage and volatility. And although that could be an equation for opportunity, which I think is why we're all here, it's also an equation for risk. So be careful, only fund your futures trading account with risk capital. My personal definition of risk capital, money I can afford to lose, doesn't change my lifestyle, doesn't lengthen my retirement horizon, and doesn't overly stress me out. Stress is a big deal. We make bad decisions when under, under stress, so be in a good spot. Easy on the day trade margins. You get plenty of day trade margins. You get plenty of leverage trading futures as it is, and we'll be taking a peek at the Ninja Trader trading platform today. Feel free to hop, pop in questions, and none of this should be construed as trader investment advice. Sorry, I have to also mention that as well. But feel free to participate in the chat. We'll get questions to today's uh, co-host of honor, Bobby Iacchino. Bobby, welcome. Thank you for being here. Yeah, honor is the part you should just leave out. Co-host is fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, just for those of you who are new, now, um, Bobby's going to be on the show on a regular basis here. And if you don't know him, uh, go to the CME Group website and CME publishes some great uh, educational videos uh, that, uh, Bob is, uh, that, that Bob does, co-founder and chief market strategist of Path Trading Partners, uh, longtime floor uh, trader way back in the day, has been involved in media. Uh, and does a lot of stuff on uh, the education commentary uh, front as well. Um, worked at a hedge fund and pretty much covered all of the gamut here uh, with respect to the futures markets and has a deep institutional knowledge as well. So we appreciate you being here, Bobby. And what's going on in the energy markets? Well, there's two things I'm looking at, and we will have the EIA numbers out during the show, which will be nice. But couple of key points is you want to take a look at, at natural gas first and foremost, because it's got the biggest move relative to its recent history. We're talking about natural gas prices above $9 here in the U.S. with the COMEX natural gas contract. You're looking at the highest level since 2008. And it's interesting because as we move away from uh, the so-called dirty carbon fuels, regardless of how you feel about that statement, uh, the country and the world is moving away from those things. One of the transition fuels is natural gas. And that means we're actually starting to get more electricity driven by natural gas instead of coal, which means we get a second seasonal bid in natural gas. We always used to look for that sort of September, October positioning for the heating season, which we also would get heating oil and natural gas seasonality, uh, heating oil in addition to natural gas and seasonality. But we're starting to see demand shift in the summertime as well and put a bid to natural gas. We've got some unseasonably hot weather when you're trading natural gas. The weather is the number one factor on the demand side of things. Obviously, we're looking at inventories, which are still stretched on the supply side of things. But we had another spike here based off of the potential for Russian natural gas to be banned by the EU. And that's taking us above $9, which, as I already mentioned, is the highest level since 2008. So, OK, so that's I'm glad you mentioned that because a lot of folks are saying, hey, natural gas are an all time high. And, you know, I didn't go back that far. Um, what was the all time high? Was it way above nine or are we about at it? No, we're close to it. We're not at the all-time high yet. It has never reached $10 as far as my charts go back. And that's as far as I look, because while being uh, very interested in the fundamentals, my entries and exits are still price action based. So as far as the highest I've ever seen is close to $10. Uh, this, this particular high is not all-time high. It's just the first time we've been above nine bucks. Yeah, interesting. Since so, 2000, sorry, since 2000. Okay. Okay. So, but still though, crazy high prices yeah. and, you know, a lot. Of, so, but now it's a little different with liquefied natural gas, right? Don't we like export a lot of that to other countries? We do. We're the number two exporter and we've gone back and forth with that number two and number one slot. Uh, we jumped into the number one slot temporarily at the beginning of the Russia, Ukraine, um, Let's just call it a conflict, for lack of a better word. I don't really like to discuss it because I'm not a, uh, a geopolitics expert. But we jumped into the number one spot. We've been exporting a lot of LNG. And part of the issue we have with that now is the cost of shipping, because these particular ships that can export fuels of any sort, 
whether you're talking about refined products, which of course we're a very large exporter of, uh, crude oil, which we just started exporting uh, back in like 2008, 2010, we weren't allowed to do that before, and refined products, which we've been exporting forever, basically. Um, we're a very large exporter of energies and the ships themselves are in shortage right now, which is an interesting thing. I've seen rail car shortages before in the crude oil market. I've actually, part of my resume that probably is worth mentioning for this particular discussion, discussion is I actually worked at a physical crude oil shop, an energy shop, but specifically a crude oil shop where we actually moved barges of crude oil. We were like a middleman shop. And I did hedging strategy and some geopolitical strategy for that. So you learn some interesting things about, for example, the specific kind of rail cars that can move crude oil take about 14 months to build. So when you have a rail car shortage, you not only can't really fix it, but you can't necessarily assume it'll be fixed at all unless there's an expectation of a year and a half to two years of those price levels. So it's a very complex scenario in the shipping, especially of U.S. energy. Yeah, that's fascinating. When you think, you know, you start up upstream, you go downstream in the whole production of crude oil. Um, and there's all these moving parts in the middle. No one would have, I would have never thought that it's, it would take 14 months to, you know, to actually manufacture one of those, one of those, uh, one of those boxcars. I mean, that's, that's crazy. Yeah, it's interesting because it's mostly based on EPA regulations. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. Obviously, you don't want a rail car leaking crude oil and losing, you know, 30, 40 percent of its payload on its route. North American crude oil is landlocked. Uh, the vast majority of it is landlocked. That's the difference between that and Brent. And that's why WTI is usually cheaper than Brent, because for, they use something called plus pipe. That's the pricing mechanism for crude oil. So it's the price of the futures plus pipe. Plus pipe is basically a phrase to describe whatever shipping is necessary, whether it be by ship, by pipeline, by rail car. The other option is by truck, which is the most expensive option. So when you sell crude oil, you sell it at the WTI price plus pipe, the buyer of the crude oil pays that price. So if you come out and say, well, I'm, you know, I'm at 110 a barrel right now, $110 a barrel. Well, they know they have to pay the shipping. So if the shipping has gone up, they might say to you, that's too much because they have to pay the shipping cost on top of that. So the price may actually go down when shipping is restricted. That's a strange little dynamic of crude oil pricing. If there is no way to ship it, then WT. TI price relative to Brent, that spread will actually widen because the price of WTI has to go down to account for the buyer of the crude oil having to pay excess shipping costs. Canadian oil sands is always below WTI. That's because there's not enough pipeline capacity. So a lot of people talked about the Keystone XL pipeline, right? That's been in the news a lot. And you hear the kind of back and forth about, well, it doesn't matter for US because it was Canadian oil that was going to go through theirs anyway. Well, it does matter because the ultimate is how much shipping is available throughout the whole system, right? So if Canadian oil cannot go through a pipeline, then what does it have to go to? Rail cars and trucks. So those rail cars and trucks are now taken up. And that means uh, crude oil that's in Ohio or crude oil that's in uh, parts of the Permian Basin, they still have to get to the refineries, which are all in the Gulf. And they used up all that spare capacity, which actually lowers the price of that WTI and hurts the producer, which subsequently makes them produce less and have a, a supply shock again. So it's very complex from a fundamental perspective. That's why for regular traders, I always just say stick with the price action and don't worry what you think should be happening. Watch what's going on with the price action because wherever crude oil is, that price is not a lie. It's real. When you see a price on your Ninja Trader, Trader platform, you can rest assured that price actually traded. And that's really what you should base your decisions on. Interesting. You know, speaking about speaking of like all the components, right? So we have crude oil coming out of a pipe and it's getting to a refinery. It's going to go through a dist distillation process. And everything I've been reading lately is the, folk, the refiners are making more money uh, on diesel than they are in regular gasoline. I don't know if this is a regular phenomenon or a unique phenomenon to now. It's unique, again, because of let's just look at the entire supply chain, right? So the entire supply chain is constricted. So what does that mean people are going to demand more of? Trucks. 
simply because things that you are used to be coming from overseas and that would come cheaper on ships are now being sourced in other places that may be delivered via truck. So if you delivered whatever the component is, let's just call it a widget, you need widgets and you normally get those widgets from, I don't know, Portugal, okay? And they come over on a ship. Portugal is not making them. The ship capacity is taken up. So you find them somewhere else, maybe Northern Canada, maybe maybe a Northeastern part of the United States. And now you get them shipped by truck. So the truck capacity is limited as well. Now, while trucks don't take 14 months to build, the actual truckers need to decide to purchase more and build more. Well, what is pro what's the problem at Ford, at Volvo, at Chevy, at everyone else? Well, they can't make all the trucks. So now you've got this issue where the trucks are getting used up and they're going to the highest bidder. Those trucks use diesel. Diesel fuel is in short supply. So refiners, and this was going to bring me to another point I wanted to talk to people about. One of the interesting components you could look at when you're trying to figure out short-term demand, okay, is refinery utilization. That is something that is widely ignored by traders. You may look at the EIA figures and say, wow, we've got a draw, so crude oil is going to go up. Wow, we've got a build, so crude oil is going to go down. And that may be the initial reaction. But what guys like myself look at is we look at a build or a draw relative to the refining utilization numbers. And those are very easy to find. You can just Google refinery utilization. And the first couple of searches that will come up will both from the, be from the EIA. And the one you want to look at is refi weekly refinery utilization percentage, okay, which will come up as a table. And it goes all the way back. I'm looking at it on my other computer right now. From the EIA, you can go back as far as 1990, November of 1990. And it'll just be a long table. You scroll down to the bottom and you'll see that our most recent refinery number is 91.8. Okay, that came out this morning. That's basically from the week of the 13th, which we obviously, we get the pre previous week. We should be getting one more a little later today. And that's up from 90. Okay, two weeks ago was at 89.3. What does that reflect? That reflects the percentage of the refinery total capacity that is being used to produce refined products. Refined products, layman's terms, gasoline, kerosene, diesel fuel, jet fuel, even uh, sludge crude oil for tar has to go through a refinery to remove sulfites. So when you look at it from that perspective, they're running at 91.8 capacity as of last week. Okay, that means seven or 8.1 percent 8.2 percent capacity left they can't do any more than 100 percent now in the crude oil industry we look at 95 percent as basically full capacity so why is that because there's always a part of some refinery that needs repair needs cleanup needs to shut down to cool there's always a certain component of it yet we've had refineries run at 96 97 percent before that is peak demand and what we're starting to see as we move into the Memorial Day weekend, this is Memorial Day coming up, right? Yes, it is. They all run together for me, I swear, Jim. But that is the official kickoff of the summer driving season. You can see crude oil has been slowly ramping up towards it. And you can see that refinery utilization, of course, is up again, moving up into that. That's because the gas stations need fuel to pay for you and me to drive wherever we're going to be driving to. So refinery utilization is an interesting bit of data that people ignore that they should be looking at on a weekly basis to judge ultra short term demand. Interesting. That is, we're going to start looking at that stat as well. You know, it's funny now that I'm a new, newfound Southerner, I, I am driving. I'm driving three and a half hours to Charlotte. I'm going to the Coca-Cola 600 NASCAR race instead of Chicago to Indianapolis 500, which are both on the same weekend. <laughs> However, I'm not the only guy doing it. There's hundreds of thousands of people doing it. So I know it's a, I know it's peak. You know, they talk about this is the start of peak demand for gasoline in the right. in the summer season. Um, let's if we got let's take a look at some charts really quick and uh, get uh, some of your opinions on uh, some of these energy markets here. Um, I have um, uh, pretty much have your same setup, right? I have a daily chart. I have on each chart we have a simple moving average and then three exponentials. Upper left-hand side, we have crude oil. That's the WTI we've been talking about. Uh, next to it on the right is natural gas. 
Uh, and then lower right, we're going to go clockwise, is uh, our Bob gas and that gasoline. And in the lower left is heating oil or ultra low sulfur diesel. Right. So let's take a look before we go into crude oil at the chart that I sent you, Jim. If you can just pull that up, please. Yes, sir. So Got this it. is basically a weekly chart um, going back quite a ways. Okay, I can't really see the date on the bottom and I think I cut that off when I sent it. But what you're seeing is a characteristic of a crude oil market. Now, I'm generally not big on looking at characteristics of individual markets because sometimes I think it takes you away from pure price action. But in this particular case, the characteristic of this market, crude oil market, is price action. So when you're looking, this is a continuous chart of WTI futures, continuous contract. What crude oil tends to do is to move sideways in a channel until there's a supplier demand disruption, and then it trends for a while. And you're seeing that repeated over and over again, going back as far as this chart goes. And I'm looking at the high being around 120. So I'm guessing that's at least till about 2014. Okay. You'll see a sideways channel, then a down channel, then another sideways channel, then an up channel, then a very small sideways channel and a down channel, switching right into an up channel, then another sideways channel, and it goes on and on like this. Now, you would think that I was showing you this to tell you that you could trade channels in crude oil, but I'm showing you this to basically tell you to be very careful trading channels in crude oil, because when crude oil I shouldn't say when, typically crude oil, after breaking out of a sideways channel, trends and trends hard. Now think about why that is. Well, number one, the seasonal effects, as we just talked about, we're going into the summer driving season. But the other reason is because supply and demand disruptions in crude oil tend to be very sharp. They tend to be some kind of a shock, whether it's a conflict in the Middle East, whether it's a... Um, it can be anything. We actually, a couple of years back, had uh, an African ship hit a reef and dump a bunch of crude oil, which caused a price, a brief price shock to the upside. It might be that second breakout on the left side of this channel where we went into a sideways channel off of a downtrend. I think that's actually it. We obviously had the pandemic where we had a sharp move and then sharp move back up. And then again, a sideways channel until we started trending into the steep channel and then followed by an even steeper channel, which brings us to today. Now, if we can go back to the regular charts, if you look sure. at the crude oil daily now, and again, that was a weekly chart we were showing, what's happening right now? We are seeing basically a sideways channel. Now, it's been compressing into a triangle and that's fine. But what crude oil tends to do when it forms one of these right triangles or even a, a, an isosceles triangle, doesn't really matter. It tends to move back into the upper part of what would be a channel. So if you just look at the uh, end of March, beginning of April, those highs right there, if you had drawn a triangle trend line down in that area, when we broke out, where did we go? We basically went up to those highs from March, right? Now we end up in another big sideways channel starting in about March, going to the highs we had a couple of days ago, right? If and when this breaks out, it's likely to trend. And what's going to cause it to trend? Some sort of demand or supply disruption. So we already know that demand is picking up. I just looked at the new EIA data that came out while we were talking. The last refiner utilization I mentioned was, what was it, 91.2 or something like that? I'm going to go back and look yeah. really quick. 91.8. Today is 93.2. That's the demand we were talking about. Now, we also had um, inventories decrease by a million barrels. Okay. That's not huge. It was probably expected to be more than that. And you're seeing a little bit of pressure on crude oil in the current chart. It's not breaking out up or down. I'm not giving you guys a trade here and I'm not telling you to do this. As a matter of fact, I'm telling you not to do this because you need a price action reason to do this. But I suspect with that stronger refinery utilization number, all else equal, we're probably going to break out up today or tomorrow. 
Okay. No, I don't have a position on. So again, I want to stress, I'm not telling anyone to get long crude oil. As a matter of fact, I'm doing the opposite. But if we were to break out above this channel line that you just drew, okay, that longer channel to the upside, and then come down and test it, and that line were to hold, it would be my price action opinion that it would likely go back up to those old highs of around 128, 130. The high on this chart, I believe, is 130.50. I wouldn't be targeting that. I'd be targeting the opening price of that long red candle toward the beginning of March. That's what I'd be targeting as a place to either get out or trail a stop. Um, that would be a reason right around there. That'd be a reasonable target for a breakout up. But I would still want to see it break out of this channel, come back and test the top of the channel and have that top hold. And that would, for me, be a trigger to potentially get long. What would then happen with these, what would likely happen with these moving averages we have that Jim mentioned, for those of you that don't know, it's an eight exponential moving average and a 21 exponential. We call that a rotation zone, okay? What that rotation zone is starting to do right now is angle up and widen. And that's when it becomes effective. We don't look for crosses on this. We don't look for anything else on this. When that angles up, turns from where it is right now to this and starts to widen apart, it becomes an effective support level and it's a dynamic support level. So you don't necessarily have to be waiting for the static support levels of old highs or old lows or breakout levels. You can follow that rotation up and adjust your trailing stop as per that rotation zone. Very awesome. All right. So let's just shoot over here. Um, we know the crude oil story. By the way, EIA.gov is the URL for that website. You could, you could lose a weekend easy just going through yeah. there with all the information that they have in that particular. That's website. why I tell people all the time, look at the, the draw versus what was expected or the build versus what was expected, then check the price action. If the price action doesn't make sense, you'll likely find the answer, not always, but a lot of the times in the EIA refinery utilization figure as to whether it went up or it went down because it represents demand on the ground today. Got it. So I just, I want to pull up and get your opinion on, on, on the heating oil. Uh, you know, so the, the uh, moving averages are behaving a little differently in this market right. than the other two. And um, so we're not in that rotation on the, on the way up, I guess would be what we'd say or no? Yeah, obviously heating oil has a slightly different seasonal pattern than crude oil does. I mean, just by its name, heating oil, right? There's not, there are fewer and fewer homes that rely on heating oil. We're more and more going to natural gas for heating. And there are really none that rely on it for cooling. Now we do export some of this stuff. So you can see a little bit of a bid, um, but I suspect that with this heating oil trade, you're likely to see just a slow rollover. It honestly doesn't interest me interest me at all from a trading perspective. This is something that I more look at as we get into sort of the spring months, because you can get these spikes in temperatures where you get these spikes in price, and they can be a very sort of advantageous breakout trade for a very short term. But right now, this, this particular contract kind of falls off my radar as we get into summer. So I, I'm going to ask a question. I, you know, I know I'm not supposed to do this. You're not supposed to ask a question you don't know the answer to, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So you know, in, two, in 2020, the International Maritime Organization said, hey, on all these cargo ships, you got to reduce your sulfur output to 0.5 from 3.5%, which means you either got to put a scrubber on your ship, which is really expensive, or you have to, get, you ha you have to switch, switch your fuel. Does right. any of these mark CME markets relate to that switch? Well, yes and no. I mean, the switch of the fuel, all of it at the end of the day becomes crude oil, but it's more of an effect on refiners than anything else. This ultra low sulfur diesel can actually be one of the, the uh, fuels that they shift to. But what a lot of the people that I spoke to said is it actually becomes long-term cheaper to add the scrubber. Also, I'm going to say something I shouldn't say since you did. Um, there's a decent amount of um, wrist, uh, what would you call palm greasing to take care of some of the yeah, stuff in the countries where the, it's actually that initial spike in March was part of that, that you saw there on the bottom left, um, was part of that. And then a lot of that sell-off was as we were finding out that more and more of these countries 
didn't necessarily have to comply in the ways that you might think they needed to comply. So, and it's very tough to research that kind of thing. So it kind of fell off the radar in terms of fundamental analysis. Yeah, interesting. I, yeah, I was always interested in that. You know, and I thought it was fascinating. But that makes sense that you know maybe the compliance uh, level of compliance is a little different than what we would expect ordinarily. <laughs> so very, very awesome. Um, all right. I mean, so really, this is you know we we've covered all four of these more or less. Here's the gasoline futures on the right. Let's just peek. We got a couple minutes left. Yeah. Let's just peek at this real quick, um, and then um, I want to tell folks how to find you. But that's uh, yeah. So this particular, um, I, I've been long this contract uh, since late April, and there is nothing on here telling me to get out of these loans. I've been trailing a stop basically at the lower end of the rotation zone. And you can see here that. So what I'll do is I'll trail my stop at a low below the rotation zone. Okay. So the first entry, which was a late April entry, I placed my stop below that one right, right there, a little bit to the left. Um, you'll see that one red candle that has a long wick at the bottom of it right yep. there. I placed mm -hmm. my stop below that because it was a low below the rotation zone, right? So we actually ended up getting a couple of days before that, which was like, oh, here we go. But it didn't hit our stop, luckily. So we came up and then we started placing our stop, trailing our stop below the rotation zone. She can go about four candles over to another long wick that got into the rotation zone there, one more. And now we placed our stop below the rotation zone below that candle. As we moved on higher, we get another move into the rotation zone, about six candles to the right. And we did the same thing there, placed our stop below the rotation zone and below that particular level. You can see now that that last spike below the rotation zone did not get below the previous low. Right. So we didn't get stopped out. Now, what we're getting now is a fifth move into the rotation zone. You can see one, two, three, four, five, if you count mm -hmm. them out. Um, the rotation zone weakens after about five moves in. So basically now I'm going to start to look for a targeted exit of this particular long trade. But from a fundamental standpoint, I expect no relief at the pump at all in the short term. And part of that is because, number one, gas stations, people should know gas stations are not necessarily. As a matter of fact, there's very few individual stations owned by oil companies. So when you talk about gouging at the pump, it is not the ultimate oil company that's doing that. And it's been proven over and over again, that's not happening. What ends up happening with these gasoline stations, they buy gasoline in bulk and they buy more of it when they see price going up because they know crude oil tends to trend and they can't drop the price until they get a new load at a lower price. Okay. Otherwise they're losing money on those loads. So until you see crude oil go into a deep, suspended drop, you're not going to get relief at the pump and that uh, those gasoline futures are likely to be bid. Got it. And also they're charging me twice as much for my hostess Twinkies and my Red Bull when I go <laughs> fill up the car. So we know where they're making their money. Um, they're smaller, anyway, uh, too, now. Yeah, uh, um, really, uh, really great information. Really interesting stuff. Really appreciate you being here. How do folks find you? I know it's it's Bob underscore Iacchino at Twitter, but you yeah. guys are doing, uh, you and Jimmy have uh, your, uh, your podcast going yeah. and the website going. Yeah, we also have a podcast, which is available free on Spotify. It's called the Futures Edge podcast with Jim Iorio. I'm the co-host of that. Um, as well as basically I book all the guests and do everything on it. You can also find it on our Path Trading Partners YouTube channel. Uh, we do the podcast once a week and it's on there as well as my partner, Mike Arnold, does quite a bit of technical analysis in all kinds of different markets. So you may want to check out that as well. So Path Trading Partners YouTube channel. And then you, of course, can email me at support at Path Trading Partners if you want anything individually. Uh oh, that's dangerous. You might get some emails. That's okay. okay. No. We answer all of them. So. In all seriousness, everybody who's listening, we, um, you know, when we do our opening range show and bars closing show, we go through and we listen to what the experts are saying in all the media, Reuters at Bloomberg, go to the CME website, look at Bob and Jimmy's uh, videos and any kind of information that's coming out of these guys is important to me when I kind of decide, hey, what are we going to talk about? And what, what kind of trade ideas are we going to look for in the morning, afternoon? So I greatly appreciate that. And hopefully, and I know for sure the audience will as well. No, happy to be here. This is one of my favorite subjects, the energy markets. They're not traded enough. And the CME's got micro crude options coming out in June. So those are going to be great as well. 
Awesome. All right. Well, our time is up. Thanks again for being here, Bob. Really appreciate it. And I'm going to leave everybody off as I usually do. Please be safe out there. Be good to each other. Thank you for coming.